Who would have thunk it? I'm a eighth grade dropout, ninth grade. I left school early. You know, my mom, I'm sure I worried her a lot, you know? Me and my bro worried her a lot, you know, early on, not knowing what we wanted, but we didn't want to become nothing. We wanted to be something and, you know, I didn't know what my future would hold. There was a little, little hope that came in that darkness. Along came my son Nas, you know. I just felt like a king was born. Every rhyme was like the best shit I ever heard in my life. Eight, nine, ten years old, we're talking about the devil and God. Ain't nobody was really rhyming like that back then. How many people have ill married? One, two, three. Illmatic was a new beginning of rap. It was like living a hustler's life through poetry. That that was a genius at work. 1994 classic Illmatic that he's prophetic. He had the courage to tell the truth about the dark side of black existence in America. Illmatic is one of those transformative moments in hip hop. A hundred years from now, that, that title is just gonna stand out for one of the strongest pillars in hip hop, period. What he was able to do lyrically completely shift the climate of how the MC was supposed to rhyme. <laughs> so honest and it's so truthful that it's never it's never gonna not be one of the best albums of all time when i made elmatic i was trying to make the perfect album it comes from the days of wild style i was trying to make you experience my life i wanted you to look at hip-hop differently i wanted you to feel that hip-hop was changing and becoming something more real i gave you what the streets felt like what it sounded like, tasted like, smelled like, all in that album. And I tried to capture it like no one else could. Going to a concert. I think to myself, wow, this is what I do for a living. I chose this, and then it happened, and now this is what I do on a regular. You know, being from Queens, that's as that's as good as it gets right there. Be here. Oh. journey ain't start with me. Yeah, I come from a long line of musicians and artists. It's in my blood. What I am today is an extension of what they were then. You can trace my artistic roots all the way through Natchez. Natchez, Mississippi. My ancestral name is Oludara. It means God is good. I was born in, in America, a place called Natchez, Mississippi, which is right on the river. 
during the, the heart of segregation, the Klan, whatever like that. You can see the, the burning of, of the crosses at all times. There are musicians all over the place, you know, on my father's side. He and my godfather, they had a group called the Melodiers. They travel all around America. But the family's been like this. Uh, musicians, artists, teachers, you know, sharecroppers, farmers, hoes, prostitutes, but they all had a higher grade of, of how they dealt with it. It was never like some low squalling stuff, but it was always, what they gonna hold, they the hold top of hold them. Whatever they did, we always did it on the top, make it dignified. <laughs> I did four years in the Navy. I was discharged in New York City. That's when I met Nas's mother. So I stayed a couple of days too long, ran out of money, and I got stranded here. And at the same time, along came Nas and his brother. It was tough for the mother, me, for the whole family then. What I started to do is start going back and forth to Europe so I can have some kind of money. And she moved to Queensbridge, you know. And I was worried, I was really worried, because I knew it was going to be rough out there for her and the kids, you know. In the 70s, you had mothers and fathers. In the 80s, you had a lot of single mothers. In the 90s, you had people being raised by their grandmothers. Historically speaking, you got to keep it in mind, the GI Bill was a bill in which persons had access to education, credit, to gain access to houses so you could live in suburbs away from the city. So black folk received very little of the GI Bill money in terms of housing, only 2.1%. That's why you could create a white middle class with black folk gaining no access to it. And then they create these housing projects that go all the way up to pack folk in like sardines. Down with hovels, down with disease, down with crime, down with fire trap. Let in the sun, let in the sky. A new day is dawning, a new life, a new America. Thank you, Mayor LaGuardia. Historically, they were built for working class families, no matter what color. But because the color line is so thick in America, once black folk made their way from the south into the cities and began to, in significant numbers, fill up the projects, you got white flight. And that white flight resulted in a withdrawal of money and wealth from the city. No, I'll tell you, Queensbridge to me, it looked messed up. It looked like a buried diamond. I had a chance to have a childhood at, for at least a little bit, you know, and then, you know, I, had to, I felt like I had to become a man early to deal with my environment. So I saw the difference early on, what type of parents I came from good people, hard workers. We had color television, we had VCR, you know, we had a carpet. We had nice things in our places compared to some of our other friends who had nothing, who ate, who ate hot dogs for dinner, who ate, who, who had no furniture, you know, was living bad. Like, we didn't really lack food. My mom was a great cook. Everybody wanted to come at our house. Miss Jones cooking, I'm over there. She had a great spirit. She didn't talk with curse words. She didn't talk street stuff. You understand? She was, she was not like that. We needed stuff. She said, I don't want y'all to go out there and do it. Find another way to get it. I'll get you. My father had a library in the crib. We had like a wall unit. It was a library. It had all kinds of books. 
Everything from the Book of the Dead. Egyptian books about King Tut. Psychology of the, of the modern man. Malcolm X. Kung Zhu. Instant facts about the world. History of Chinese philosophy. It came before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertum. Aesop's fables. Afrocentricity. A Tao the King. From Superman and Man by J.A. Rogers. The Bible, Proverbs, trials and tribulations of ghetto life. I found that helped him a lot. My pop had been all over the world in the Navy and, and then traveling through his music. So he had a lot of stories to tell me and my brother about places outside the block, outside the neighborhood, outside New York, outside America. Man, I'm in cold, man. Uh. So there'd be a xylophone made of wood, trumpets, guitars, maracas. They were toys to me, man. My pops would leave, we, we'd just be banging on those things, you know what I'm saying? See, Nas, I thought Nas was going to be a great trumpeter. He would play trumpet every day with drummers outside um, our building. I took the trumpet away from him, I said, you can't play now because your lip might get, get messed up. Wait until you're like seven, eight years old when your lip is more, more mature. He was very, he, he was furious about that. He loved it. So by the time he got to be seven, you know, I often horn again, he said, no, I want, I'm into something else. He used to wake me in the, up in the morning with rhymes every day, like, yo, how does it sound, how does it sound, how does it sound? But since he was waking me up in the morning, I would tell him, yo, yeah, uh, I didn't like that word. You said this, you should have said, you know what I mean? He used to come back, wake me up again, yo, how does it sound, this is better, da, da, da. But I knew he was the best as soon as he, I ever heard him rhyme. I had a friend. A real friend, William Graham. We called him Will. We used to play around and make music when we was young. Uh, me and Will, we'd make tapes and, and, and stuff like that and play them for our friends. We looked forward to getting together and making tapes. Willie lived right upstairs. He was like my surrogate son also. So he had another way of looking at the world. And the combination of the two, their minds were like, boom, like an explosion. I used to go upstairs his crib and he'd be baking brownies and taping videos. So one time he said it to a girl on the phone. She said, she, I guess she said, what you doing? He said, just baking brownies and taping videos. And he bust out laughing. <laughs> and, you know, it gets to him, it sounded real soft. <laughs> so every day he'd say to somebody, what you doing? Taping, baking brownies, taping videos? Like he'd say this to everybody. It's all I want to hear. He made you laugh. He was all about having a good time. That's how we was. We was like two peas in a pod, you know? And um, we, was, we was working on music all the time. But back then, it was like just playing around. And if you want to see a smooth black Casanova, play Casanova. Back then, the vibe was different. The music was, you know, based 808s in the, in the music, and people was having a good time. I mean, the style was like fresh. It was colorful. It was rich. Well, they used to have the jams in the park, and one of the DJs was from my block, DJ Hot Day. Hot Day was known throughout the neighborhood for bringing out his equipment. Everybody here that the jam is getting ready to happen. And you see them carrying the equipment to the park, and sometimes I try to help. It was life. It was greatness. It was like so much potential out there. It wasn't until later that I started to see the deterioration and um, see the effects of, of what they started to call crack. We're fighting the crusade for a drug-free America on many fronts. The city was about to look crazy. It's sad. And it wasn't just a gangster thing. Any and everybody made money off crack. It was survival to the fullest. The collapse of the inner city economy has created a new way of life, an economy based on drugs. People that's older than me were more hip to what was happening, and they were making money off it. So, you know, it, it, it spread everywhere. And I'm just sitting back watching. I wanted to give you that feeling 
of New York at nighttime. You know, you look at things like shots going off every night. You're seeing what's happening around you and pregnant ladies trying to smoke crack. It's a $100 billion a year business. Crack-related crime is soaring. Dudes is late night waiting to rob you, and you just maneuvering your way through that. And then the crazy cops coming through, because they had to be crazy running after somebody in that neighborhood at night. The atmosphere was lit. So now I'm jetting to the building lobby, and it was full of children probably couldn't see as high as I be. It's like the game ain't the same. Got younger niggas pulling the triggers, bringing fame to their name, and claim some corners. Crews in broad daylight, stick up kids, they run up on us. Four fives and gauges, max and fat, same niggas that catch you back to back. Catching your cracks in black, there was a snitch on the block. To survive here with a family at that time was help, believe me, especially if you didn't have any help. And we had no help. Yeah, my parents had reached like a final breaking point, you know, where it was it. My pop just kneeled down to me and gave me that one on one. I'm sure he said, you know, what he had to say to my brother, too. When he came and talked to me, he gave me that you're the man of the house speech now, I'm not gonna be around now speech. One day they had a crazy fight and my father never came back. And I used to look out the window and my mom told me he wasn't ever coming back to the house. She said he can't come in if he do knock on the door and I'm there and she ain't there, don't let him in. And that shit just, um, that shit fucked me up in the mind a little bit because I was so young, my mom has never dealt with me as a kid. She always talked to me as if I was her age or I was, I was smart enough to know anything that's going on. So when she said that shit, you know, I just knew it was real. I'm like, fuck. I just kept looking for him out the window, but he never came back, man. You know what I mean? He moved around Harlem, you know, to somewhere else, and I visited him there. My mom never spoke anything bad about my father. My mom felt that, you know, she had been done wrong, I guess. You know, she was a hard worker who took care of all of us, including my father sometimes. You know, he wasn't always working. She was the one who provided for all of us. My father had a lot of talent. We got the talent and um, stuff from him. I think that's where, you know, that, the talent came from his side and, uh, you know, the intelligence, but the smarts, and then my mom's was so smart, man. Like, I don't need My mom's is dead, and my father's alive, and I don't really want my father to really fucking even know him. Damn, I love you, Dad. But, yo, my mom's, I wish she was here to be, like, praised as much as he is for Nas's life, especially for Nas. Anything to do with Nas, yo. My mother is the one that, you know what I mean? Without her, we would be no nothing. We'd have been gone. I know there's times when my mom be crying or sad or she just moments where she be hugging us when we little and just talking about how things gonna be all right and all of that. Those were great times because we had a beautiful home inside that neighborhood. Our home was 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 right and for the most part. And um, we had a lot of love, you know? So she was just really positive and um, happy you know she laughed we laughed together a lot um she really just wanted the best for me and my brother i used to be going this way trying to go to school and shit and see all of that early in the morning. Somebody get shot, all kinds of shit. It was less police, so shit was real. I had to go to junior high school 204. That shit was like Rikers Island. That shit was like jail. It was junior high school. Hey. 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 
Well, I found out in New York, they were not raised like we were raised on the South, nurturing, you know, with your own people raising you. He had never experienced any, any no love like that before. And I went over to, to enroll him in school. It was almost like enrolling him into hell. It was shocking to me. I felt very bad to see that my father was raised in a nurturing school system. I was raised in a nurturing school system. And here come my kids. I have to have kids in New York City, and they're into this. I did like school in the beginning. I only remember good teachers in elementary school and junior high school a little bit. There was Miss Broconi. Well, Nas was in a bright class in first and second grade. And I remember we did a project. The children had to make a face, their face, on a mask size form. I was hanging them up. And then I stepped back to look at them. And I saw Nasir's face. And it, he wasn't happy that day for some reason. And he had captured himself perfectly. And I thought, wow, this kid can express his feelings. They tried to put me in like a slow class in, in elementary school, and my mom raised hell and got me out of there. I still had dreams. Like, I wondered what it would be like if I was in art and design or some other school that, you know, that really would push some of my talents, you know, that I thought I had. But um, when you grow up in an environment where the taxpayers are not making a lot of money, then they don't have the funding for schools. And uh, when the schools don't have any money, you get a no money education. And you wind up getting people who's not motivated and start looking for other ways, faster ways. I would just stop paying attention. I, I would just daydream. And in junior high school, I got kicked out and put into another junior high school where I really didn't care anymore. So by the time it was time for high school, it was like, I mean, grades was terrible, and I didn't care. So I found uh, an assistant principal and a math teacher, and they told me, say, your kids don't belong here. It's not, this, this will destroy them. They don't care. They were old enough then. They were men to me, because I, I felt I was a man at that age, 13, 14, or whatever. I said, I'll tell you what you do. Go work. Make you some money. This is America. Quit school if you want to save your own life. Develop your craft or whatever you want to do, and I'll back you. They smile. I got calls from my mother, my sisters, everybody. How dare you? How could you do it, you know? I wouldn't have felt right the rest of my life if I let them just stay in that school and keep being beat down and teachers not, not really having any love for the kids and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, he told me if they're not teaching me nothing, then don't go and try and figure out life on my own. And, and I'm smarter than the teachers anyway. And um, they was just there to hold us back. He said the whole school system was just holding black men back, black little boys back. So he told us don't, um, you know, read our own books and, 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 you know, teach ourselves what's going on. And, you know, he knew, I think he knew that we was going to be entrepreneurs. So he told us that we didn't need school. And my mother didn't agree with that shit, but it worked for us, yeah. You know, my mom's biggest fear was us not doing school. And at the end of the day, I didn't want to hurt her. My friends, you know, all of them were in the game. I didn't want to do that full time. I didn't want to do that at all, really. And I really didn't have to. I planned to be something, like really something. You know, I was just really in the with music, writing, whatever, just anything around arts. And I just kept telling myself, this can't be my career, this other thing. It can't. I had a passion for creating things, so that was going to be my out. We came here tonight to get started, to call act ill or get retarded. <laughs> Back in the day, 
bitch Rock said Shate was getting a name as this big rapper in the neighborhood. And she came in my building one time and she heard us in the hallway trying to rap. And Shate said, Look, um, you know, I want y'all to come perform with me. There was like some Queensbridge Park jam that was gonna happen that we heard about. And she wanted to bring us on as a crew. It's like, oh wow. So we talking about this every day working on it. That's when we started to realize we're not really good. So she asked us, you know, spit for it. It's a different time. And we we tried to rap and we started laughing because it wasn't coming out right. She didn't laugh. She said, listen, if y'all don't have your routine, next time I see y'all, I'm fucking both of y'all up. She's older than us and taller than us, and we believed her. Basically, around 84, I started sampling at the crib in Queensbridge. Now, the funny thing about me making records, I didn't make records or get into this industry for the money or anything else. If I was making a beat in the window and it was blasting out, and somebody was walking through 12th Street, if they didn't stop and do a two-step or something, I would make a new beat. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen we got MC Shan and Molly Mall in the house tonight. They just came from off tour. They want to tell you a little story about where they come from. 1985, maybe I'm 11, maybe I'm 12. My man comes to get me, yo, there's this new song by MC Shan. Oh, he's like, yo, he got a song called The Bridge about the neighborhood. Which was never meant to be a record. That's crazy. It was meant to be intermission music for Queensbridge Day. But the tape went around Queensbridge, and hey, became a Queensbridge hit. I mean, the rest is history. You love to hear the story again and again of how it all got started way back when. When I heard that record, I just stopped everything I was doing. It was like, oh, shit. You automatically knew it was a smash. You know, the pride was crazy. You know, we had an anthem. It was on the radio. People knew, yeah, I'm from Queensbridge. I couldn't believe they, they lived in this neighborhood with us, you know what I'm saying? So that was amazing to me. And then you say, there go Shan, there go Marley in his car. You meet people and tell them where you're from. Most people never heard of this place. That song changed everything. I go down south, I'm a Shan fan and everything. I'm a fan of everybody else, but I'm really good. I'm really feeling good about my neighborhood and everything. I get back, the day I get back, the kids is talking about this South Bronx record. And I'm like, what? And it was like, yo, this is record. They dissed the Shan and Molly. I'm like, all right, well, let me hear it. South Bronx, the South, South Bronx, South Bronx. Oh, South man, Bronx. you know, wow, they, oh, they hating, you know what I mean? Oh, they trying to be like Shan and Molly. But it was also raw that he was just going South Bronx, South, South, South Bronx. Bronx. Get it, South Bronx. Bronx. Oh, the beat is tough. I can't front. So Shan put out Kill At Noise. Rap in any style, all categories. Fresh freestyle, surreal, live stories. Jam is dedicated to you and your boys. And if you knew what I knew, then you kill that noise. And then the bridge is over came. I said, the bridge is over, the bridge is over. It just silenced everything. It was like, oh, oh, they're not playing. Manhattan keeps on making it. Brooklyn keeps on taking it. Bronx keeps creating it. And Queens keeps on faking it. Yeah. Oh. I was like, it's real. It was a battle. I'm Shan was in that battle. Shan did his thing. Karis one did his thing. The morale went down to Queensbridge until the Nazis came out. That was our lives, you know what I mean? That was not only our lives, that was the whole Queensbridge lives, you know what I mean? Then we knew fucking KRS-One just said the bridge is over and all that shit. We was little kids coming up under that shit. Like, you know, the bridge ain't over. We super ill niggas out here. Like, so we had to let the world know how ill we was. Like, when everybody thought in hip hop that the bridge was over, we fucking crazy, we was ill. I already knew I had to prepare to block that hate out or to tear that down. And my choice was to tear it down. Represent, 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 represent,
As a kid back then, I felt like every day was one step away from the end. Me, my man Will, and my man Bo, we went to see Aliens 3. Will never smoked weed, but we thought it was the best thing. Smoking weed just chilled us out, especially Will. He can, you never know, he's unpredictable. Somebody come around and say the wrong thing, he's on their head. But so I felt like if he smoked, he'd be chill. We're watching a movie, and Will's, let me hit that. And he really hit it. Yeah, we like, oh, this is crazy. And uh, when we got back to the block, me and Bo had went to go get some weed, but Will stayed on the block. And I think he was collecting money because we was throwing a barbecue. So everybody that's out there that's hustling, they got to put in too. Somebody thought that he was extorting them and started yelling and smacked him. He had a big Gucci link chain with a big Mercedes Benz medallion. And she popped it. He was already on one. We was lit up for the movie, so he just reacted back. He beat up this girl and shit, and um, she called her baby father and her boyfriend, her baby father and her brother, and the niggas had stepped to me. I remember I was sitting right here. My man ain't never hit no girl in his life. Matter of fact, if a girl got hit out there, they could come get him, and he's stepping to somebody for the girl. It's just like, in the heat of a moment, certain violations you know, you react to them, and that was a first. I was sitting right here, and the niggas had stepped to me like, yo, where's their will at? Where's their will at? And one nigga was like, you know what I mean? He's like, he's going to do it, you know what I mean? So I knew they wasn't playing. I tried to lie to them, but they was serious. So I told them a super lie, like, yo, he went that way. Then when he came, when Will came, I was like, yo, he was over there where them kids is at, and they saw us. And, and I was like, Will, they coming now. He said, nigga, I'm not running from nobody. And then when the dude just did this shit, I looked at him and he looked at me and his eyes opened up wide and I saw the life leave. His eyes stayed, stayed in one position. And I was like, oh shit, he's dead. So I was, thought, I was like, yo, shit, today is the day that everybody's going to die. I thought I was going to die too. And, uh, and I felt the bullets plucking through my shirt and my pants. One right here in the shoulder up there. It grazed me, took a little meat off, and then um, one came through my leg from the back and came out right there. Nas came out this building right here. He's talking to a girl in this building. He came out this building right here and walked over there, looked at me on the floor. I said, yo, don't tell mommy. <laughs> I swear to God. I told that nigga, don't tell mommy. Like, I could strength that shot and somehow spend the night out and come home without my mom knowing I got shot. When I heard the shots, I came, you know, I knew that the shots would happen in the area where we at. So I went downstairs and I came outside and the first person I saw was my bro, was Jungle. He was on the ground. And I, his eyes, he was, his eyes were open. He was, he was good. Then I see my man. And, um, So he wasn't moving. I mean, at that point, it was like, we let somebody take one of us out. You know what I mean? Like, we, it's, it's it, man. Like, it's, it's, we might as well all go. Nothing mattered no more. We, whatever. I ain't blaming nobody, but I would have moved. You know what I mean? If my son got shot, all right, I used to tell my mother this shit. Why didn't we move, yo? I had to come outside and look at this block again and all that shit was traumatizing. That shit made me into like a crazy person. That shit made me a shooter and all that shit. That shit made me like that. Give me a cigarette, yo. You know, at that point, even life itself didn't seem too valuable. Somebody else's, mine, nobody seemed valuable at that point. Will was a lot of things to Nas. He, he was very creative, just like Nas was. He was very knowledgeable about, about a lot of things. He read 
basically, they thought basically the same. And they're basically brothers in a way, you know. So I noticed his demeanor did change. He got more uh, maybe cynical about the world or whatever. He had a little sadness in him, a little hurt. Now, I can still see that in him sometimes. To me, it made him take life serious because he was right on the verge of getting that record deal around that time. And it's either you sell drugs and be in the hood forever or you do this music shit. Once Will died, he did music. We didn't even barely see him no more because Will was down with what he was trying to do. They was all together trying to do the music shit. After he passed, it was like he was, was orchestrating things from upstairs. <laughs> It was around that time, man. We felt it happening. We felt like something good was about to happen. We got introduced to Nas, Duel, my homie Joe Fatal, and his boy Mel Kwan. They came to me and said, yo, we got this guy. He wants to make a demo. You know, he has his own money and everything. And he wants to see if you can make a beat for him. And he's like, yeah, I'm up here working with Eric B and Rakim and Kooji Rap and, and, all, and all these big names. And I'm like, damn, you know, this was it. This was where, you know, the hit hip-hop albums were being made in this studio right here. There's a lot of dudes, a lot of street dudes. I was, I mean, me and Nas being young, 15, 16, and we going inside, and um, Lars is like, yo, go in the booth. You know, everybody talking, and he just, just quietly like, go going to booth. Now he's going to booth, he's throwing a beat, and they start rhyming, and everybody get quiet. I was in the Mecca. I was inside the place that everybody wanted to be. <laughs> in my mind, this is what I was thinking, right? All right, you wanted to do this? You here now, baby. You here. This is it. Do your thing. This rhythmatic explosion is what your frame of mind is chosen. I leave your brain stimulated. Niggas is frozen. Speak with criminal slang. Begin like a violin. End like Nevaya Thin is deep. Well, let me try again. Wisdom be leaking out my grapefruit troop. I dominate break loops. Giving mics ministry cycles. Streets disciple. I rock beats this mega trifle. And groove even smoother than moves by Villanova. You're still a soldier. I'm like Sly Stone and Cobra. Packing like a rasa in the weed spot. Vocals are squeezed. Glocks and CZs drop. Though they need not to Sneak. My poetry's deep. I never fell. Nas's rap should be locked in a cell. It ain't hard to it tell. Hard. Who's that back there? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Man, that boy, nice. God damn. The nigga is old. Man, how old y'all? It was just like, yo, that's crazy right there. Like, yo, you good? Like, yo, you good, man? I'm excellent with that, man, right there. So we was on from there. And let me yeah. formally introduce my boy. So. This is my man, the rapper Nas. Nasty what Nas. Up? I started off on my verse from Live at the Barbecue. Everybody was just excited. You know, this is something new. This is going to come up and change the game. They're not even going to see you coming. Hey, 
It was one of the illest lines anyone had ever heard an MC say. When I was 12, I went to hell for snuffing Jesus. I mean, I must have rewound that like a hundred times. This main source album is brilliant, but um, who's that kid? Oh, it almost felt like within a week, everybody wanted to know who that guy was. Nas said the line, when I was 12, I went to hell for snuffing Jesus. And I said, but like, who is this guy? You know, it's crazy. I went on a mission to try to find him. I originally met Nas in 92, and Nas was at G-Rap's crib. Uh, it wasn't until 93, when I was working on my solo album, that I really got to know Nas. And he came to the studio when I was doing Back to the Grill again. Back to the Grill again, the Grill again. Back to the Grill again. So get up and get down. Search will never stand still. So here's a true or false, tell me if it's back to bull. You want to kill the clam, shoot the fans out of track to pull. Got crazy games so no one can stop me. But hey, yo, I'm white. I guess my game is hockey. Back to the Grill again, the Grill again. Yeah. Back to the Grill again, the Grill again. The grill again. Keep a tech nine in my dresser, lyrical professor, keep you under pressure, mind like a computer, the inserter, paragraphs of murder, the nightclub flirter. This is nice, kid, you know how it runs. I'm waving automatic guns at nuns, sticking up the preachers in a church. I'm a stone crook, serial killer who works by the phone book. We're waving automatic guns at nuns. I never saw those verses as being shock and awe. They weren't just about the words themselves. They were about an emotion and a feeling. So you had to use an example. Like, I am so angry at the system that I have to channel that anguish and that frustration into waving automatic guns at nuns. For you, I got a lot to shoot. Songs are here. My robs are hotter than a prostitute with gonorrhea. On the mic, I live for cavalry spill. It's like that jaw. That jaw, kick him in the grill. I get a call from my friend MC Search. And Search says, I found that kid you're looking for. You know, that kid Nasty Nas from Queensbridge. And he said, not only did I find him, but I got two demos on him. I said to my boss, if you never let me sign anything, just please let me sign this kid, you know? And he said, okay, all right, all right, you know? And that's kind of how it happened. Right, right, right. I always wanted to be on Columbia Records. They just seemed like the most serious record label to me. But now I'm invited in, you know what I mean? And I'm like, it's about time y'all recognize, right? And I'm looking at all the history on the walls. I'm kind of looking around the place like, you guys were waiting for me. You know, I'm talking to the walls and the desks and the plaques and the um, the floors and people walk. I'm like, this is, you guys have been set, setting this up for me. And I'm here, that's how I felt. I'm like, this is home now. He never told me I got the deal. Like, he never said that shit. He just came back with the money. You know what I mean? Like, yo, I got some money. He didn't tell me how much he had or nothing. He just was like, yo, what you want? Go to Macy's and get it. You know what I mean? He brought me some gas jeans and shit like that. Like, yo, yeah. And you want some money? I got you and all that shit. And I didn't even know what he was doing. I didn't know how. I just figured, Cool, you got this little bit of money. That's the most money we ever gonna have, ever. And you know what I mean? This is the end. You're gonna do some videos, and we good. We back in the hood, and that's the shine that we got. I didn't know that shit meant the world, you know what I mean? I thought that shit just meant the bridge. You know what time it is? Y'all hear the bridge beat. This the Word anthem out. right here, no y'all. That's, that's where you guys are from, right? I think. Uh, no question. Clean yeah. bridge in the house. True. All right. One, two. Yo, but people, you know what I'm saying? Like, people has definitely been waiting for the album. Why don't you let them know what's, what, what's going on with that? Yeah, the album getting ready to come out in January. The name of that is Illmatic. Oh, you heard Live at the Barbecue. You heard Back to the Grill again. So now it's album time. New York State of Mind was, I knew it was going to be the first record on the album. I'm bringing you through hell and back. I'm bringing you in. Here it is. This is song number one when you pop in that tape. <laughs> I said, I want to do something that's slow, so I'm already thinking, dog, some walk with me type of joint. And yo, it got to make you do this, and, and that make you do that. Straight out the fucking dungeons of rap, the fake niggas don't make it back. I love you flipping with the funky rhythm. I be kicking, musician, inflicting composition of pain. I'm like scarf. 
face, sniffing cocaine, holding the M16. See with the pen, I'm extreme. Now, bullet holes left in my peak holes. I'm suited up with street clothes. Hand me a nine and out the peak. When I wrote the review for Illmatic in the Source magazine, I didn't know that it was going to change hip hop. I only knew that it changed me with one listen. Illmatic's the album for the 90s era where I was growing up. The stories he was telling was something I can relate to. The Illmatic will always be number one. Coming from Dallas, Texas, Illmatic was my secret. It was my weapon. It was the steel that sharpened my steel, which set the tone for Baduism and everything else that I would do. In 1994, I was nine years old. I came up in Fayetteville, North Carolina, so a lot of things didn't make it to me. He hit us with life lessons and insight on how to maneuver through this world as just young black men in America. Fab Five Freddy, I'm in the laboratory with my man right here. It's big now, nice, son. Silmatic, 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 Silmatic. Nas called me. It was like, yo, I got one more slot on the record. Come to the studio, bring all your discs, bring all your beats. I didn't even get a chance to play anything. The first beat that I pulled up was Life's a Bitch. I'm from Brooklyn, I'm from East New York, and um, you know, where I'm from, the homicide rate is like an all-time high. When I wrote Life's a Bitch, uh, another one of my homies just passed. That was like the third one. A lot of brothers was incarcerated. I shot it at one of my homies, and it was like, damn, son. Like, oh, shit. I felt it from the heart. Visualizing the realism of life and actuality. Fuck who's the baddest of person status depends on salary. And my mentality is money orientated. I'm destined to live the dream for all my peeps who never made it. Cause shit, we were beginners in the hood as proper sinners. But something must have got in us. Cause all of us turn to sinners. Now some best in the pieces. Some are sitting in the wind. I'm obsessed myself and trying to carry on tradition. Keeping the swap of best to seek out of Western society. Cause it provides us with the proper insight. You got us. Even though we know somehow. The rhyme flow from an MC perspective that the nigga put down was crazy. But when you say, I'm destined to live the dream for all my peeps who never made it, nestled within all of that street grimy shit the nigga talking is hope. I want my belly on my board, take 20 years to play with. Enter the battle, back to leave my life. Tell the church, church. I'm a physical prey. Tell the way because I'm in it. My quarter through life, the God created. I got pride, 665, man. You will pluck the hunt. I'm up to fight the bus. What? That's what I bust for. Talk my skull. It's pain in my brain. Body maintained. I'm going against the word. Simple in my When I was young, I used to do my thing. Rob and follow the take their wallet, they jury and rip their green card. Took to the hood, flash in my quick ass. First piece of ass, first piece of ass. It's all about cash and the bundles. Niggas, I used to run with his bitch and do a year in the hundreds. I switched my motto. Shout out to Sam, fuck the mom with that buck. That bought a bottle, cut up, shot the lotto. It's how I look back, loose back, produce back. Kept up, just small pieces of your two bags. Time for zero, man, and keep that. Full fabric, back of four bags. The quick number five is your life. You did it, you did it, you did it, you did it, you did Early on, my pops told me, you know, you're going to be the man in the house, I'm out. My mom sold us, you know, and he's still your father, he still loves you. You know, all that, that story, and it was like, I'm sure I wasn't happy about it, but, you know, to me, I've always been like, that's life. You know, keep pushing. Life's a bitch, and then you die. That's all you get high, cause you never know when you're going to go. The track. It just had a jazzy feel to it. I just felt like I could hear my pop on it. I just asked him to play something that reminded him of when me and my brother was kids in the neighborhood.
mean, that 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 record is the is the mindset of most people today. Still, it's still me. It's still who I am. As far as when you listen to those words, it's sort of like philosophy in a way. You know, it's like you know, it's talking about life. That 19 year old was the beginnings of me. You know, it's the beginnings of who I am today. And if it wasn't for me in that that mindset then, you know, people wouldn't know, people wouldn't be with me today. The vibe of that song is straight Tony Montana, Scarface. The world is yours. That's what it said on the blimp. That was it. That that was serious in the movie when he saw that. Um, it was he, it was like a sign. I saw this jazz album. Ahmad Jamal and I, you know, just threw it on one day as I was vacuuming in my room and I heard um, the loop go by. So that's when I started making the drums. I was like, mm, let me just put something in there that's kind of like, not just your regular boom bap, but something else like a ting, 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 ting. the first beat and when he heard it I saw him just freeze you know what I'm saying and just you know just start closing his eyes and getting the idea he came up with the idea of me singing the hook and I wasn't I wasn't with it he's like nah I want you to sing it man and he started singing it the way he wanted me to do it and I did it you know what I'm saying whose world is this the world is yours the world is yours Best describing my life to name my daughter, my strength, my son, the star will be my resurrection. I had no idea I would have kids in that order the way I wrote that rhyme and what their sexes would be. It's just I spoke that on my first album, and that's how life turned out. That is just. Chilling. Alright, peace. Yeah. I was born right here. Snacky boy. Hey. What up? <laughs> oh shit. Oh shit, what up, man? Good, baby. What up, man? <laughs> Karate K? What's up, baby? What's up with you? Man? This is the dude baby. here that used to snap on me every day. Good, if I bro. came outside and my sneakers was fucked up, he would send me back upstairs. This dude is the best ever. The best. Hey, what up, baby? Huge fan, bro. Oh, love. Just a map. You already know. Yo, I could bring cameras. Y'all all right with that? <laughs> Just want to check with y'all to make sure. Peace. How are you? How are you? What up, baby? What up? Nigga got Good. big as hell. Yeah, I'm home. I'm, ain't little messiah no more. You ain't little big messiah now. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> home, my nigga. Yeah. All right, what's up now? What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Okay, y'all. Yeah. Hey, peace. What up? Uh, uh, 
I love you too, babe. I never saw that I'd be having this day to look back and think about where I come from and, and made it to where I'm at. This was a story that needed to be told. It was already told by MC Shad and Molly Maul, Craig G, Shantae, the Juice Crew. You know what I'm saying? It was already to tragedy. Um, it was already told. So I was just an extension of that. You know what I'm saying? They paved this way. They, they made this happen. What's up, little man? Come here. Give me a five. How you doing? What's your name? What's your name? Noah. Noah. Nice to meet you, Noah. What's your middle name? Stay good, man. What's your middle name? Yeah. Now, see? Give me five, man. Yo, look. Everybody with that name are kings. So we are kings, okay? Just know that for the rest of your life. Don't ever think anything else. Just know that you're a king, all right? My man. Be good. What's up, man? Give me five, give me five. I remember being in Europe and uh, hadn't seen my boys for a long time. So I went out to Queensbridge to look for them. And a man with a camera, a guy I knew, he said, hey, there are your boys. And they come running over. They, they hugged me and kissed me and shit, and then posed for the photograph. I just never forget how they looked. Because they, they had changed. I had been gone so long. But you could just tell they would been they had been released from their mother's arms, and they were just out there, just having fun, you know. Yeah, it's Illmatic. Yeah. When I first saw that uh, Illmatic cover, I knew exactly where the photograph came from. From the looks of the photograph, you could just tell this way his mind just opened up. To me, his mind was saying, "Wow." What a world. What a world. So you'd have this your background for Illmatic. Danny Clinch, the photographer, when he showed us this picture, it just felt like you get a chance to see in the neighborhood in a larger way. One time for your mom, one time. Yeah, whatever. One time for your mom, one time. Yo, whatever. One time. That day was a big day for me because we had made it. We were rolling out with an album. We were doing a photo shoot for the album. There was no stylist. There was no budget for anything except cameraman. To get to that point is the biggest day of your life. So we were celebrating. Come outside, y'all. Camera crew is outside. Everybody knew Nas was a rapper. You know, he had a song out. So, you know, people came outside. There's a lot of people around that went to kill each other that just got together that day. Just um, for the pictures and shit. So, that was a crazy day in the hood. Everybody got their turn in Queensbridge for something to happen. Some of them people gonna catch murders. Uh, some of them people gonna get beat up. Some of them people gonna go to jail. But all of them people gonna have a story. Everything will happen to each individual in that picture one by one. He's doing 15 years. He's fighting a murder. He's doing life in prison. He just got locked up, no bail. My man just, um, he just did some tough shitload of time in fucking North Carolina, breaks crazy ass life. He do a bunch of fucking time in and out of jail. And this shit is real, this surprises. I 
That's fucked up. It's so fucked up just to see what happened. You know what I'm saying? Like, it makes me really realize if it wasn't for music, you would have told a story about that kid too on the bench. If it wasn't for music, you would have went along that line telling that story, or maybe I wouldn't even been in that picture. That's not what I wanted to see happen to nobody in that picture. You know, I wanted, I wanted the best for my friends. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's crazy. I still have dreams about being here. I still have dreams like I'm here. I don't know what it means. I feel like every hood is haunted by the brothers that walk through there. You know, the essence of them is still here. It helped, it helped put, make this place what it is. They kind of like govern it spiritually, you know what I mean? So you always remember the homies. You always remember the ones that meant a lot, that died for even this neighborhood, that died for, for us to be here. I feel like a voice for those ones that passed on, you know what I mean? Because I was here, this was me, this was what it was about for me, you know what I'm saying? This was like, this was life. Large professor hit me and told me, yo, you need to link up with Nas. I know you got it. It was Large and Akinelli and Nas that came out. We had a little setup in Fight's basement. Nas was like, yeah, I just need that shit you do. You know what I'm saying? Like, that mystic shit. I played him what was to become One Love. Or is born, you got six minutes on that jack kid, or shit is real. Yo, 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 check this shit out, man. Hey, yo, go, give me a cigarette. Yo, here you go, here you go, here you go. Yo, check it out, man. Check out what I got here, man. What is that? What's that? Yo, it's a letter I got from my man Nas, man. I find myself getting letters from friends who were locked up all the time and, and, and you know, me saying what's going on in, in the free world and him telling me how he's maintaining and asking me questions and us going back and forth, you know, on just keeping his brother's head up. I never heard a record where somebody's writing letters to people. If I did, it was like a love song or it was never from a street perspective. So One Love was about keeping people's head up in locked up situations. What up, kid? I know shit is rough doing your bit. When the cops came, you should have slid to my crib. Fuck it, black, no time for looking back is done. Plus, congratulations, you know you got a son. I heard he looks like you. Why don't your lady write you? Told her she should visit, that's when she got hyped. I heard he looks like you. Why don't your lady write you? That right there, if you examine those two bars and, and just look at what happens when we get incarcerated. You know, you're dealing with an African American, a young African American disease almost is incarcerating black men. Not only do you incarcerate them in a physical sense, but you incarcerate, you emasculate them, you incarcerate their manhood, their identity.
their spirit. What up, kid? I know shit is rough doing your bit. When the cops came, you should have slid to my crib. Fuck it, black, no time for looking back is done. Plus, congratulations, you know you got a son. I heard he looks like you. Why don't your lady write you? Told her she should visit, that's when she got hyper. Flipping, talking about he acts too rough. He didn't listen, he be ripping while I'm telling him stuff. There's a thing that we say in the hood, yo, she's a good bitch, she gonna bid with you if you get locked. She's not fucking around. She's galvanizing on your people, making sure you getting visits. She's holding you down. But when you're black and then you're in America and you're in the hood, no income, hard to find a job, crime all around you, there's a cloud of dysfunction that just hovers over that young sister. So just in that line, I heard he looks like you, why don't your lady write you shows how the prison system also destroys, you know, union and love and family. You know what I'm saying? And destroys promise and hope. Not only for the person who's incarcerated, but those people who are attached to them on the outside. Thank you. Yeah. Rest in peace to my nigga Draws. Rest in peace to Ill Will forever. Rest in peace to Bar Kemp. Represent to all my niggas. We will here for you still. We love you. The Hip Hop Archive was established at Harvard University to support art, culture, and knowledge of hip hop and its followers. The Nazir Jones Hip Hop Fellowship is designed to provide students and artists with the opportunity to demonstrate that education is real power. Can we all just welcome Professor Morgan, Mr. Nazir Jones, and Professor Skip Gates. Everybody I grew up with, no one finished college, no one owns the store, owns a bank. Dudes is doing life. You know, dudes are dead. Dudes are, are you know, in the streets, or don't know where they at, you know? So an album comes out during that period, right? Could you imagine being approached by Harvard at that point? It's like, if it's going to be the Nasir Jones Fellowship, it's got to be someone who's been consistently working and building. You want to make a contribution to the world. I said our friends be in the projects of jail, never Harvard or Yale, years ago. And, uh, and here we are. So that they realize that this is an art form, this is a contribution to world civilization, being studied at a university like Harvard, being preserved in a hip hop archive, having fellowships created for the geniuses of the genre, like Nas Jones. 
I represent my friends that didn't make it. I represent all the guys because they helped me get here. They just their conversations, just us riding out together as young teenagers. The things they told me, the things that I told them, and we mix it all up, and the things we survived, and the things that we lost. Like I represent all my guys, you know what I'm saying, that didn't make it here with me. You know what I'm saying? From that were there from with me from the beginning. I didn't trust anything. I didn't trust anything outside the world that I lived in. I didn't care about politics. I didn't care about America that much. I didn't care that much because I didn't believe that it believed in me. So today, you know, thank God I'm here. I, I, I made it through the storm, and uh, this is an amazing honor for myself, and if, if I may say so, to hip hop too. Oh man, give it up, give it up. A kid dropped out of school, kid from the projects in New York, you know what I'm saying, gets, you know, gets recognized. This ain't about just music. I wanted to do Illmatic to leave my voice, my opinions, my philosophies, my ideas in music form and rap form as something that was proof that I was here. P watching Gandhi till I'm charged and writing in my book of rhymes all the words past the margin to hold the mic I'm throbbing mechanical movement understandable smooth shit the murderous move with the thief theme plenty at night they won't act right the fiend of hip hop has got me stuck like a crack pipe the mind activation react like I'm facing time like Pappy Mason with pins I'm embracing wipe the sweat up my dome spit the phlegm on the streets sway Tim's on my beats makes my cypher complete weather cruising in a six cab I'm on tarot jeep I can't Call it. The beats make me falling asleep. I keep falling, keep but never falling six feet deep. I'm out for presidents to represent me. Say what? I'm out for presidents to represent me. Say what? I'm out for dead presidents to represent me. me. World is this? The world is yours. The world is yours. Smile, smile, smile. World is this? The world is yours. The world is yours. Smile, smile, smile. To my man Ill Will, God bless your life. To my people throughout Queens, God bless your life. I trick we box some crazy bitches, aiming guns and all my baby pictures. Beef with housing police, release scriptures, that's maybe Hitler's. Yet I'm the mild money, getting style, rolling foul. The versatile honey, sticking wild, golden child, dwelling in the rotten apple. You get tackled, a caught by the devil's lasso. Shit is a hassle. There's no days for broke days. We sell and smoke pays while all the old folks pray. The Jesus soaking their sins and trays. A holy water, odds against nods and slaughter. Finger the word best describing my life. To name my daughter, my strength. My son to start will be my resurrection. Born in correction, all the wrong shit I did. He'll lead in right direction. How you live in larger broker, charge cards are mediocre. You're flipping coca, playing spit spades and strip poker. The world is yours. The world is yours. The world is yours. The world is yours. Smile, smile, smile. Whose world is this? It's yours.